in GIS, in GISA basically we're kind of keeping long running conversations. We develop relationships with people. We really look carefully to the work and how uh, people here relate to it. And it's a very different uh, way of doing it. Uh, we really allowed uh, it, the school to connect with practices that we believe are meaningful and that are connected to what we stand for. And that's the case with Marian uh, Isofu, uh, that it's a dear, I would say a dear colleague, colleague at Columbia GSAP, and personally also I'm very happy to say that it's a dear colleague and friend. Uh, and, uh, and to start with, she's, she's now a New Yorker, right? And you've been a New Yorker for a while. You have, it's one of the places where your office operates. And you spoke here for the first time in 2019, presenting your work at the Constructing Engaged Practice Symposium that uh, Juan Herreros organized. But soon after, in 2021, during the time of remoteness, I would say, you gave a second lecture followed by a conversation with Mario Guden. And this was great. I mean, I remember through the pandemic, this was a moment basically of enlightenment and imagination and tension and relevance that uh, we all felt like energizing. And I think this conversation kept going and going and going and kept growing. And, and now we, we're very lucky that three years later, uh, we feel that this conversation never stopped and that it was the time to, to give continuity to it publicly, I would say. And that's what we're doing now. And I'm so happy that, that Mariam and Mario felt the same way, and actually they came with idea, right, to Barjan, and uh, why don't we do a, we keep it with the conversation rather than starting a conversation or doing a lecture. Um, but for me, Mariam is also a colleague, but also a friend, and after almost a week being in the same room in Amsterdam with Mariam as a jury member of the inaugural Amodo Architectural Award, and most importantly, sharing uh, the limitations, I would say, of Dutch cuisine, and. I apologize to Mark and other people that could be. I think this is something that, that uh, keeps people connected for life. But I must say that also I knew your work very, very intensively and I love your design. And then I discovered that what I, sus I was very suspicious of, that this work is only possible through an amazing intellectual engagement and a commitment to what is happening to the world and to understand how architecture is part of it. Uh, that of course I knew through your conversation. Marian is someone that is a designer, a builder, a practitioner, but one that understands architecture and even the profession of architecture as a site where critical positioning happens inevitably and where architects have a great opportunity to operate politically, but by taking very seriously what they do as architects and the agency that is contained in it. Operating from New York, Zurich, and Niger, uh, one of the most uh, active cauldrons of transformation in West Africa, as you've been explaining us, uh, her practice, Marian is a few architects have attracted planetary attention, I would say, by its unique way of mobilizing grounded languages to reinvent the way architecture responds to social, environmental, and cultural potentials. Marian has advanced the notion with, of intersectional sustainability. For her and her practice, their intersectional approach goes beyond meeting green standards. Intersectional sustainability is as much about the environment as as it is about sustaining people, their cultures, and livelihoods, and this is quoting Mariam. Their projects include the, the Hikma Community Complex, a library and most complex in Niger, which won the two global Lafarge and Holcim Awards for Sustainable Architecture, Niamey 2000 Housing, a response to Niger's housing crisis that was shortlisted for the 2022 Aga Khan Award for Architecture, and you're now working in your office, and you are working on the Yantala office in Niger, the Ellen Johnson Sirtlef Presidential Center for Women and Development in Liberia, and the, the Bedby Museum in Senegal. Uh, Mariam is a professor of architecture, heritage, and sustainability at ETH Zurich. She has also taught at Brown University and the GSD at Harvard. Is, uh, Mariam is the uh, 2019 laureate for the, for the amazingly important Prince Klaus Award. Uh, and she was named, or you were named, as one of the 15 creative women of our time by the New York Times. Tonight's conversation will happen five years after Mario Wooden transformed Columbia University by turning Wood Auditorium into the site of his amazing performance, Working on Water, in collaboration with choreographer Jonathan Gonzalez, 
and writer Tuto Durham Somo. I remember how basically we were all mesmerized and very aware that something very important had happened in this room. I, I, I think maybe we'll say this is a Nakelari or something like that. This is totally transformed the school. Working on water explored the dark spaces of architecture from the cultural topographies of water to the topological conditions of deep space. Mario Wooden is professor of professional practice, director of the MR program here at GSAP, and co-director of the Global Lab, uh, Africa Lab at Columbia University as well in GSAP. An innovative research initiative that explores the spatial topologies of the African continent and its diaspora. He's also the director of Mario Wooden Studio, Architecture Plus Design, a transdisciplinary practice dedicated to the design and exploration of architecture and its relationship to culture and knowledge. His work has been exhibited at MoMA, Independence Biennale, the Architecture Museum, the, the TU München, the, Nether, the Netherlands Institute, Architecture Institute, the Storefront for Art and Architecture, the National Building of uh, Museum of Washington, D.C., and the Municipal Art Society in New York, among many other places. So this is going to be an amazing continuation of your conversation. Thank you for sharing it with us, and let's go for it. Thank you for such an, an unbelievably amazing introduction and really generous introduction, most importantly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Andreas. And um, as Andreas said, um, uh, three years ago, almost three years ago to the day, I think it was October 4th of 2021. Yes. Yes, that we had um, our last conversation. So, yeah. Okay, so let's dive into it. Um, and, you know, you know, we had a brief conversation a couple of weeks ago, and so I said there are you know, a few themes that I want to tease out, but, um, and this isn't meant to be uh, too provocative or too, uh, well, anyway, let me just give you the question. <laughs> so I'm nervous now, but okay. <laughs> so what does it mean for you to have an anti-colonial practice or practice that resists the legacies of colonialism? And this is something that we started talking about. A massive yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say I almost don't think of it as anti-colonial, even though that's clearly what we're doing. Um, it's, it's a lot of um, trying to tease out and separate sort of um, all the dogmas that surround us in terms of what is considered to be what architecture should look like what the styles should be, what the references are, et cetera, et cetera, and separate them um, from actual reality, separate them from local um, conditions, local legacies, local heritages, and really sort of understanding that this way that we have of practicing architecture, of learning architecture, and of teaching architecture really comes from just one point of view. Mm -hmm. It comes from one unique point of view, from one part, tiny part of the planet, and that there's something in a way a little bit absurd um, in, the, in, the, in the sort of um, habit of making it universal, of wanting it to be universal. And I guess therein lies the colonization, <laughs> right? Because essentially we're saying that something that is really relevant or came out of one little portion of the planet needs to be or is powerful enough to represent the entire planet there's something that feels a bit wrong about that. And there's also something incredibly um, violent also about such a notion, because what, you're, what that inherently means is that then everybody else is denied any form of thought or representation or sort of opportunities for continuity or for decisions, agency, you name it. And so for me, my practice was born of kind of that feeling of that that need to almost re re revolt it was it was it was revolting to some extent it was revolting and it was also quite frankly i know i'm using a strong word but i really mean it humiliating there was something incredibly humiliating and degrading the thought that somehow all the answers lie with just one set of a part of a world population of one set of people it even comes with a complexion etc mm -hmm. etc et there was something just incredibly just baffling and clearly wrong um, with that. And I was very much interested in um, the place of architecture within this problem, especially with the understanding that architecture has been really sort of a powerful tool 
of advancing that kind of way of looking at the world. And then the question then is, how do we redress that? Or how do we step away from that? And how do we actually start practicing in ways that are much more logical? Um, but also that, that sort of um, are more dignified mm-hmm. at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are, there, are there examples of the ways in which, let's say, things are done mm-hmm. there in, in, in Niger that then inform your practice going forward as you worked on some of these projects? So we were just commenting the, uh, before the introduction about the... Um, about the cultural center and the construction of the dome. Mm-hmm. And you said, you know, it was amazing. There was no form work. It was brick by brick. Yeah. I mean, did, how did that, let's say, inform the way that you think about the design process or making drawings or, um, yeah, or th- just the making of architecture? Yeah. Well, I think the magic of that was just really, um, how did I forget? The magic of that was really coming from the perspective of saying, arriving, arriving back home after getting an education in the U.S. and really deciding um, to approach it as though I didn't know anything. I did not know anything about architecture. I did not know how to make buildings because I was very much interested in figuring out what the differences were and what I could learn um, from sort of the local conditions and the local skills. And thanks to that, then I was able to really trust in both the process, but also the skills that I found on the ground. And so the example you're, um, uh, okay. <laughs> um, the, the, the example you're evoking um, is a great one in the sense that we found ourselves, you know, building this project, having to make these series of domes. Um, we had this fancy contractor um, from the capital who came to the village to make these domes and they had made this, these form work first out of wood it didn't work then they tried to make it out of metal you know and it just produced these weirdly misshapen domes and it was literally the end of the project i we found ourselves in a in a in a real crisis but at the same time that we were building this this new building we were also renovating um sort of this adobe mosque next to it that we were turning into a library and there were masons there who were coming from neighboring villages who were um doing the um, the, the remodel saw our distress, our evident distress, and came and one of them came and asked me um, if, if we, we wanted him to try to make the, um, the domes. And, and I remember just asking him, you know, what, what, do you know how to do this? And he was like, you know, do you want me to try it or not? And we just said, yeah, sure, why not? You know, go ahead, you know, give it a try. How are you going to do it? And I was like, don't worry about it. I need three people. You know, we're going to jump on top of these, yeah, here. Yeah. Um, and then we'll just make them. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, what kind of equipment or tools do you need? And they're like, what do you mean? We don't need anything. Just give us the brick and a ladder. That's it. And then they just get on top and they just build these domes, one brick at a time by hand, nothing else, and produce these absolutely perfect, amazing spheres, semi spheres. It was, it was incredible. And it was such a learning experience, but also sort of an incredible sharing uh, moment with the other parts of the team that were more kind of sort of, sort of um, had, they, they did a lot of the, um, the concrete work, for example, that, that were in a more Western um, education, I guess, um, that they had. We all learned so much from this process and it really was a confirmation that there's so much intelligence that we don't have and that our pedagogy or, you know, sort of our textbooks do not include, but that is very much real and equally valid and much more powerful in certain settings. So does that change the way that you make drawings? Like now you go, oh, I don't don't actually need to draw that detail. This is the issue. (laughs) Yes, This project is a big problem now because we keep being asked for um, drawings from the projects or, you know, to show it at exhibitions. And we don't have much by way of drawing. (laughs) We just made basic, I mean, the most basic plans, the most basic sections, and then that was that. And there was a lot of drawing in the sand on site. There was a lot of prototyping on site. There was a lot of trial and error. And there was a lot of learning from resources like these, you know, just sort of always remembering that there was a lot of um, communication with those traditional masons who knew how to build like this mm. and who actually taught us not only um, 
really kind of mini lectures almost, you know, on, on this kind of construction technique, but also had incredibly insightful things to say about the techniques we were using, which were hybrid with, you know, both kind of the concrete element, the earth element and all of that. It was, it was incredible. It was a complete masterclass. Yeah. Well, I could talk about that I, project. Yeah. <laughs> I could talk about this project all day, but yeah. I'll come back around to detail uh, a little bit later. I do want to uh, maybe talk about your your design philosophy, and um, Andreas uh, referenced it. Um, what you call intersectional sustainability, mm -hmm. and how that um, informs uh, this uh, this resistance. Um, and I'll, I'll just sort of. Um, quote you again, our intersectional approach goes beyond meeting green standards. Intersectional sustainability is as much about uh, the environment as it is about sustaining people, their culture, and livelihoods. So I'm wondering if you could say more about the use of this term, um, intersectional, which of course was uh, intersectionality was coined by Professor uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who's at our law school. Um, as a way to describe bias and violence against uh, black women. And of course, the term is used much more broadly today in terms of where power comes from, how it collides, how it inter uh, interlocks and intersects. But I cannot help but, um, and we just saw the cover of uh, uh, Adilwe's uh, Mamami's book, Sarunia, right? And for those of us who may not know, um, uh, this is a, a novel that, concern, that is concerning the real-life battle of Lugu between Anza Queen Sarunia and the advancing French colonial forces of uh, Paul Vallée and Julien Chenon. And I know you put that in there purposefully about Queen uh, uh, Sarunia. So can you talk a little bit more, maybe tease out for us your use of intersectional, because there's something that you're slipping in there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's incredibly um, complicated and layered, of course, but I think at the very basic level, um, I, I kind of came to, to talk about that, and it's actually someone, um, one of my team members in Zurich who um, applied that term intersectional to what we were describing in terms of sustainability and this idea of different layers coming together if you are very serious about sustainability, even for the environment, in terms of saving the planet, there is something about um, realizing that there are more forces at play than just what we see as emissions. Um, and that even those are actually um, intertwined with a whole bunch of other, um, a whole host of other um, forces and factors. So for instance, when I think about building in Niger, and I use earth, I'm not really doing that necessarily from a desire to be ecologically responsible, even though that's a nice side effect, but it is ecologically responsible, but it's also affordable. This is one of the poorest countries on the planet. So that is the responsible thing to do. So there's sort of this thing, uh, something about the economic sustainability of a material, of a building practice that builds into environmental sustainability. There is also sort of something about the DNA of the place that then gets to get expressed because local materials are about something you know that is deep and profound um, to a, a certain environment. Or to, uh, and then they, they, it also says a lot about energy consumption. Again, not directly, but because the materials are adapted to the local environment, to the local climate, the forms are adapted to the local environment and local climate, then you're doing something in terms of energy consumption that doesn't have to be you know, transferring that over to photovoltaic, you know, um, solutions, which you're consuming the same amount of energy, you're just using a different type of energy. And I was just struggling with that notion because there was something about that that I was uneasy about. This idea that it's just a transference because we don't really want to sacrifice. We don't want to use less electricity. We don't want to, we just want to be able to do it in such a way that we don't feel like we're damaging. But the reality is that we're incredibly wasteful in the way that we use resources, energy, you name it. And so this idea of this intersectionality was really about looking at all of these different layers, looking at all the economic forces that drive um, construction and building, looking at social um, environments and how a building can actually speak to um, social realities, enhance them, or sort of um, even political um, 
um, setups or religious. So in the case of, again, the, the Hikmah project, this is one of the projects, what, a project where I really understood these different layers were not only are in terms of the the economy of the project this is a project where um, we were allowed to do it because we said from the onset that we would be able to deliver it at below the budget the client had and the client had that budget for just making one building instead we provided four um, including the renovation of a building that was going to be destroyed and everything in between and still came below cost and then that that we we made that as a campus because we had all these conversations with um, the local populations that really unearthed a certain need of certain types of spaces, places for literacy, places for coming together as a community, places for women to be able to actually find themselves within that community, for the youth, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of a sudden the project just took on a whole new dimension that helped to sustain the entire sort of social fabric of that of that village and also of the villages around actually end up coming to the center now um, for special occasions, you know, or for attending um, different workshops. There's literacy, um, um, accounting workshops, you know, all kinds of different um, empowering activities that happen there. And that's what I mean when I'm talking about intersectional sustainability. But then of course, we're also talking about what you're saying, you know, that's under um, the cover of all of that by addressing all of these different um, issues, we also have to go back and tap into the memory of the place, a lot of what has been erased. Mm. When we're able to start unearthing these erased um, parts, something starts happening that, again, allows us to come up with the right solutions um, that, that that sort of um, fit into the, the realities of these places. But there's something about reclaiming oneself, sustaining sort of a spirit that is that becomes um, so much easier once you have this kind of approach. And I think that's something that we have, that we completely disregard in architecture, this idea that architecture can be disconnected from the human experience, as though it was, as though it was some kind of sculpture that is just sort of to be looked at, but actually it's incredibly intertwined with the human experience, with the human spirit, with how you view yourself and how you project yourself out in the world. And if it doesn't have anything to do with you, hence those quotes, yeah. then what are we, what are we making? What is the point? You know. Yeah. And, and can you tell us maybe a little bit more about the reaction of? You know the local actors, the the kids, the women. I mean, with these amazing buildings and this amazing reconstruction. Well, that's the reaction because as we were finishing the mosque, so in the same village, they also had this um, plan to um, remake the um, the market, the local market, because um, again, the markets, in the, the the village markets are weekly, and they had this idea that they wanted to have a permanent daily market in order to boost the economic activity in the village. And so again, same story where they had a certain budget, which we thought was overinflated. It was supposed to be these concrete, you know, big shed um, that was going to um, house the um, the future market. And we just asked to be given the chance to design something. If they don't like it, they don't have to allow us to build it. Um, and we ended up providing twice the amount of stalls they needed. Mm. Um, at, again, below cost, which was, um, a big deal, but that market. One thing that it did is that because of all of because it was very whimsical, it was very playful. It became this um, almost sort of a um, social media sensation <laughs> um, in the country, where there was just a lot of people who would go there and take pictures of themselves and post it on Facebook. And there was sort of this idea <laughs> that this sort of bewilderment, almost, which was also heartbreaking. Um, where many people would tell us, I cannot believe, you know, that I get to be in a place like this. Or we would hear comments from people who are in the um, in the capital telling us, well, how can you make something like that in for a village, a, you know, sort of a, a market like that for a village? And I think what they were talking about was kind of this sense of worth. Who is, who has the right to beauty? Who has the right to kind of thoughtful spaces, were considered spaces. And there were just sort of so many layers there in those sentences, you know, both from um, the inhabitants of the village 
really sort of being in disbelief um, that these sort of spaces were um, where they live and this is what they use on a daily basis. I think that again speaks to what we've done, you know, with architecture and making it sort of this exclusive, elitist, you know, just only reserved to a select few um, where actually we have the opportunity to be so much more as architects and to provide so much more. So with that project in particular, actually, all of them, I mean, there's a, um, there, there's a kind of recuperation of knowledge there yeah. because the, uh, in, in the presentation here, we saw, you know, the images of what the market looked like before in terms of that building technology, which in this case, it's, let's say, elevated somewhat, but it's still a kind of local technology. Yeah, exactly. And that, I, I think there's something very important there because um, I was very much thinking that um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel most of the time. I felt like in the 20th century, we've gotten this into this habit of thinking or this need of always being, of always inventing. There's always this thing that you have to make something new, which I don't necessarily think that has much value, actually. Um, making something new just for the sake of making it new doesn't really do anything, aside from stroking our own egos, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So I was, what I saw in the old village, in the, in the old market, was a system that worked. Um, you know, it was just simple walls. There was this thatch roof. It worked. And then I was just thinking, how can I reimagine the same system so that it looks at once familiar, but also still kind of projects you into a future mm -hmm. to some extent, really projects what you already have and moves it forward. To me, that's what I saw as the need. And essentially, that's how we've been operating, especially in Niger, through all of our projects. It was really about analyzing what was already there, understanding um, sort of spatial logics, material logics, um, like I said, socioeconomic logics, and just adapting them to the 21st century, essentially. I mean, I think one of the most beautiful moments in, in the, the market is actually the tree and then the courtyard and creating yes. a place for community, for oral histories to be passed from one generation to the next generation, exactly. even other kinds of technologies to be passed. Because the tree had, had been there for almost 100 years, they told us. And the tree was already sort of the central place around which the market was organized. So when we were building the project, we just moved the temporary market you know, offsite and we used the exact same grounds. We did not shift it. We just wanted to make sure that we kept all the habits. And it was very interesting on the on market opening day. Um, it was fascinating to see how the market was essentially invaded and appropriated immediately. There was no hesitation. Mm -hmm. There was no moment of wondering, what do I do? You know, how do I hang? It was within half an hour. It was fully filled. It's next door to the middle school. At recess time, exactly 10 a.m., all of the children came out, started playing around the tree, and now it's become also sort of the playground, you know, like of, of, of the village. But it was just kind of astonishing to see how fast it was appropriated and how natural it felt. And to me, that was sort of the most important indication of having done something that makes sense. Um, I mean, I think looking at, I mean, again, these are uh, amazing images and amazing photographs of amazing work. Um, some of us might be struck by the level of precision and craft of construction. And maybe that's a little bit paternalistic, you know, in a European American audience. But again, speaking for myself as someone who geeks out over detail, um, I, can you tell us more about your approach to material resources, to labor, and the translation, again, for example, with the market of traditional building techniques to, uh, you know, let's say, to modern construction? Yeah. That's a good question. I think what you one thing I started realizing was that whenever we dealt with a lot of concrete, as you can see here, you know, there was just, it was always a struggle because there was, you know, it's a technology that's not as well mastered in certain parts of the world because it kind of, you know, was, um, was brought in. And so for me, it's always been this dialogue of trying to figure out how to use as little of it as possible and how to use as much 
of the material that is familiar as possible. And then after that, it's just really about instilling a certain form of rigor in the execution, of course. So of course, then that means that you have to be on site all the time. <laughs> but um, that only needs to happen, you know, the first few weeks or so to kind of get the ball rolling um, to some extent. I actually was I found that it was not that hard to really sort of get to a certain level of precision, precision and detail and execution once the materials and approaches and techniques were familiar. I think actually the problem was when we're bringing in techniques and materials and approaches from elsewhere and, you know, needing to train and to really sort of um, communicate uh, a material culture that is alien is when we run into problems. So, um, you know, among the, the different hats of yours, you are also the professor of heritage and sustain architecture, heritage and sustainability at the ETH. Um, and it seems to me that there is a lot in your work and in architecture on the African continent that the rest of the world can learn from. Um, and I'm wondering, what are your thoughts about that? And um, uh, how do you, let's say, approach that relationship, if you will, as maybe not as part of an anti-colonial practice, but always sort of being aware of yeah, your positionality in terms of that, that context? Yeah. This is something that I, I really struggle with, I have to say. Um, I always felt sort of ambivalent when I'm teaching on this part of the world, but then I'm practicing, you know, elsewhere. There was sort of always this tension between, well, what is it that I am teaching, really? Actually, you know, what is it? What is it that? Um, what is it that I'm communicating? And what is it that I think matters in terms of um, what what students on this side of the planet learn? Um, and then the I think the current approach or the kind of current thoughts that I have on that um, have have gone in the direction of saying that we are all, all sort of in this intertwined world, right? Um, where the what we see as the world here, all these riches that we enjoy, you know, whether it's here or in Zurich, you know, and all of that came from somewhere. Um, and that this world is the result of plunder, um, exploitation, resource extractions that continue. And so then the, the conversation um, that we have in Zurich is actually about, you know, for the students, their place in that world. Number one, understanding that that's the world in which they live, what they enjoy comes at an expense or kind of as a result of certain violences. But then how do we then stop being part of the problem? So this is sort of the challenge. Rather than always having this, um, I'm very wary of the approach that, that wants us to go elsewhere and save that elsewhere somehow. Um, I'm much more interested in an approach that allows for them to interrogate their circumstances and their context and to see what is it that is actually enabling the, the sort of continued um, struggles elsewhere and how can we then um, think of the world and architecture um, and certain types of pathologies that sort of continue to to embrace um, these these various you know systems that um, that we're struggling you know with, um, these um, eternally this eternal coloniality mm. I guess um, what is it that enables it and how do we actually extract ourselves from it so that we no longer participate in the harm um, is more the conversation that we're having, I guess. So um, I want to turn maybe a little bit now. I mean, we talked about practice, process, touched upon restitution. I want to ask you about futurity, hmm. um, which I, I gave you a clue that I was going to yeah. ask about this. Um, you know, so there is a CNN show called Inside Africa. Hmm. And the tagline is, Inside Africa introduces you to innovators, entrepreneurs, tech trailblazers, and artistic visionaries shaping the future of the African continent and beyond. 
that's the that's the tagline. Yet, given the long colonial history um, of extraction on the African continent, how might we resist that desire of the world that now looks to the continent somehow to save the planet, mm -hmm. you know, from the damage that's been done to the environment, to ecologies, um, you know, by these colonial powers? How do we resist these new forms, what I consider to be a new form of, of extractivism? Mm -hmm. Because again, um, the problem is being displaced you know, as usual. Mm. Um, when, when we think about um, climate change, you know, or sort of the way in which we've, we've um, damaged the planet, the African continent accounts for less than 8% of that. Yet because it's growing, because there's a lot of building to be done, then all of the lessons are supposed to be either coming from us or for us yeah. um, to make sure that we build responsibly, that we don't exacerbate you know, the problem that is already there, where really actually all the work needs to be done here. Um, it's not an African problem. <laughs> and it's not, Africa is not the place to look for, for any kind of saving or, sav or savior um, sort of um, approach. However, um, I think, and, and this is why I, I, will, I like to not look at it from kind of a more dog dogmatic point of view, where I, I think by just applying common sense, once again, when we're building on the continent, we have this sort of unique, unique opportunity, um, so speaking of futurities, to really think in a very, in a very independent way, you know, again, not kind of this top down, you know, we're being taught you know, how to how to build and how to do these things, but actually interrogate our our environment and, and our context to do it properly. And by properly, I mean in a way that makes sense for that particular context. And this is true for everywhere else. And the reality is we're not the only ones who are um in a way jailed <laughs> inside of this this um this Mo modern or our contemporary um, dogma of, of construction or of building, you know, that we have, the entire planet is really um, a victim to this. And in a way, so people love to ask, you know, to your point, um, the question of oh, what, can, what, can, what can Europe learn from Africa? Or what can the world learn from Africa? This is always the question. Um, but I don't really understand that question in the sense that it's not a real question, I feel. It's not a genuine question. Mm -hmm. There's something that feels incredibly condescending about that question in the sense that it's implying that there isn't much to learn mm -hmm. to begin with. So that's why you're asking the question. Because you don't ask yourself the question of what can Europe learn from Japan? You never hear that question. Or what can Europe hear from, I don't know, some, some place else. But there's something about that interrogation that makes us feel at once um, that we are being open-minded and kind, but at the same time doubtful <laughs> that any, you know, any, any of that could be possible. But this is just a long-winded way of saying that um, it's definitely not a responsibility of the, of the continent, number one, but that the continent, on the other hand, has sort of this powerful, lives inside of this powerful moment where it gets to reinvent itself to some extent on its own terms. And it's sort of this magical time to practice um, there currently because of that, um, because there's so much to be built still. There's so much to work out still um, that then it's, it's a hopeful moment, I guess I should say. And um, what role do you think that, let's say ancestral knowledge plays in that? Um, in my studio today, we had a, a, a visit with uh, Sanupa Hansa Luger, who's an indigenous artist from New Mexico. And Sanupa has coined something, to make sure I get it right. And then my students are here, so correct me if I, if I misphrase this. Um, he calls it future ancestral technology. And um, I was looking at, and I think it's going to come up here in a um, couple of seconds. Is it the Death Bee? museum um which as i understand it the, the concept is based on a, a certain kind of spiritual relationship with with the earth and the museum itself is doesn't come up it's not monumental it's mm -hmm. actually sort of 
it goes down yeah. and, and almost disappears. It's buried. Yeah. Yes, it buries it's and buried. almost disappears from the from the from the colonial gaze. Yeah. Can you maybe? I mean, I, again, this is sort of um, this was a very difficult project for me um, because I almost did not participate to the competition mm -hmm. um, for the simple reason that I was very ambivalent about even the typology of museums. There was something about museums that is considered just good and amazing, you know, and just sort of this positive thing, but I've, that I've always seen as a negative force, actually. Because again, from where I come from, museums are just the containers for plunder. Mm. And th the plunder that I'm talking about, I actually watch happen even in my lifetime, you know, in the part of the world I'm from. And then I go and I see these objects in these museums that the rest of us never get to see. Um, and then the other aspect was that there was always this frustration that um, people would voice that on the continent museums um, are hardly ever um, visited. Most of the time they're left empty or kind of falling apart. But then nobody is wondering why, you know. One of the reasons being that museums as they are here and museum going is a learned behavior. There's nothing inherently, you know, um, sort of desirable about it um, in, in this particular form. Not to say that art, art is important, art is valuable, experiencing art is important, but the way in which we display it and we enshrine it in museums is not necessarily something that everybody is interested in or should be interested in for that matter. So I was very conflicted. Um, and then I just started thinking about um, the, the local context and what, what sort of artistic expression was and what art um, represents and how art is treated, you know, traditionally, ancestrally, um, how art just, and this is not um, the case only in this part of the world, is actually in most parts of the world, art is also a conduit to spirituality. It is, um, art objects are also com communicating um, with sort of other worlds. And how in this particular context, the way um, that some of these sacred objects and the spiritual objects were treated was that they would be buried below ground mm -hmm. and then sort of started to um, go from there and treating the artwork in the same sort of ancestral manner where it's sacred, it's below ground as a sign of respect actually, um, as a way of elevating it ironically and say that it's so precious, it's so important that you kind of bury it so that it, it stays kind of um, nice and protected. But then also we really understanding that, as I said, museum going is not something that is necessarily native um, to, to most places, th this act, and that there was something much more valuable in that particular context, which is togetherness and community and coming together and spending time together. And so then the museum became sort of this inverted museum mm -hmm. Um, where the public space is actually the primary element and that's what you see and it's you know an amphitheater and it's you know places to picnic with your family you know etc um, and then the museum itself you you enter if you want to or not it's not that important the art below is not that important but then we make sure that you have glimpses of it as you traverse um, the site so that it could lure you, you could go or not. But but this is something that comes back in a lot of um, the projects that we've designed in Niger where going inside of a building is not that important. Even though we make the building, yeah. it's the same thing for the cultural center we made, the same thing even for um, the Hikma project where a lot of what happens, a lot of the interactions are in between the buildings. It's the spaces in between and because it's a very warm climate this is and that's why a lot of the architecture that i design also tends to be sort of fragmented mm -hmm. so that um it reads um so that you have moments of relief from that interior which actually can be quite oppressive when you stay for a long time and it's you know 115 degrees <laughs> inside um i'm not sure how we're doing on time but um i definitely want to ask about the Helen Johnson Sellis, just because um, you know, she's the kind of icon, I think, in, in the States. And if you can tell us about that project and, um, and what it's like to kind of work on, on that project for first woman president, president of Liberia. Yeah. yeah, on the yeah. continent. Yeah. First woman president on the continent, yeah. No, I mean, it was, um, I mean, it is an incredible honor, you know, to, to begin with. 
And also it was sort of one of these amazing um, setups and experiences where it, it just so happens that the entire team of architects on this project are women. So, you know, whether um, for me on the um, uh, building design architecture um, side or also um, collaborating with Smile Valley for the exhibition design and then the local architect we're working with is also um, a woman who um, runs her own firm. So there was also something very novel, you know, even for all of us about that, because n none of us had been in a situation where um, our counterparts or um, our collaborators were women. Um, so that was kind of strange and, and wonderful all at the same time. Um, but the nice thing also about that project was that discovering Liberia, which was incredibly different from Niger, you know, both climatically, um, culturally, historically, um, it has layers that I had never encountered before, you know, whether it's civil war, you know, and all of all very, very difficult um, sort of legacies and, and circumstances, navigating all of that, navigating the... Um, um, some just kind of stark realities that come from um, that kind of history. For example, something as simple as electricity um, being a massive problem for the simple reason that during the um, during the war, a lot of electrical poles had been removed to be used um, to fashion weapons, you know, to fashion all kinds of. So there was kind of an entire infrastructure that had been dismantled and that was being rebuilt. So then that the architecture has to respond to. How do you make architecture that again doesn't consume much electricity? Um, that doesn't. So there was, it was a lot of the same questions um, and the same sort of uh, solutions we had to provide, um, but for completely different reasons all of a sudden. But it's it was really reinforcing this idea that there's so much more that we can do. We are so wasteful, just to repeat myself. But we're just incredibly wasteful. It is. It is so. It, it's not. Um, it's entirely possible to make architecture that is not sort of this machine that just strips the world, you know, of all of its resources, whether it's through the materials we use, the energy we consume. Um, there are just some very basic things we can do. And this project was definitely one that was incredibly challenging from that point of view, but that was also incredibly satisfying. Um, but that through which we were also able to continue the same process of working with local makers, working with local manufacturers, especially because they have a massive wood industry, for example. They export a lot of wood um, throughout the world. And so it was sort of this incredible opportunity to work with all of these uh, materials that we, had, we weren't working with before um, and finding these local experts Similarly, that we had done, you know, in Senegal or in Niger, and realizing that the same processes are actually transportable and, you know, duplicable, I guess, um, yeah. elsewhere. Yeah, well, I think a, a number of us are really looking forward to going to visit it. So, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um, I, I don't know, maybe we can take some questions yes, from the, the audience. That would be amazing. Yeah. Uh, I think a mic is coming. My question is a little bit about memory and generosity. Um, if, if we consider extractivism broadly, as Mario has, and you have sketched out, you know, whether it's plunder of resources or artifacts or, or knowledge, um, and then maybe the flip side is internationalism or the sort of figment of this imposition or export or import, depending where you are, um, does it preclude sharing in the sense that if architecture is along with oral histories, a, a, a way of maintaining knowledge, right? Whether it's the brick dome or something else. Is it only a local knowledge or is this actually something that through drawing or other ways, you know, you know, could be shared without suddenly becoming an export or an, an imposition, right? Because I worked in India in, in the early 90s as an architect for two years and I mean, I, I went to villages that somehow remind me of some of the images we've seen today and just thinking about the, the tools and, of course, there's culture, but there's also just things that could evolve and still be applicable. That's for many things. It depends who's doing it, right? So who is doing the sharing? Who is receiving? I think that is actually the main issue. Um, and that is the trickier 
fight because I think we all have very good intentions. And sometimes, um, and, and this is why even when I started working in Niger, which is my home turf where I grew up, I still did a huge amount of research. I still sort of suspended all of my you know, education and thinking and just absorbed. Because there's something about, there's something that inherently happens when we either come from this part of the world or learn from this part of the world. There's something that happens in both directions when you go elsewhere. Number one, we tend to think that we know what we're talking about. Number two, the person across from us thinks that we know what we're talking about, and that's a problem. Then there can be no sharing. There can be no learning. And this is not an individual problem. It's systemic, and it's, psycholo it's deeply psychologically rooted. So it's a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and I think going elsewhere is something to never, ever take lightly. It's very difficult for it to not be damaging, despite our best sort of um, intentions, I would say. So yes, they can be sharing, cool drawing, you know, but again, that sharing has to be, even, even the decision of the drawing, for example, what does that represent on the other side? Because draw, a drawing can mean something to us, but it doesn't have necessarily the same value or the same sort of learning or teaching capacity um, and vice versa. So I think it's just incredibly complex, I would say. Yeah, and it's also a matter of the systems of power that yes. have historically been in play. So exactly. your example of, of the domes, you did sketches, drawings in the dirt, yeah. right? There were, that was not a construction document that you could, let's say, share. Yeah. And if someone expects that, right, that's based upon their power relationship that exactly. they've had, that they, oh, this is the universal drawing that right. must be made. Exactly, right. exactly. And there's something, again, about that, you know, just sort of immediately exposing the fact that there's nothing universal actually about that drawing, and it's actually not that important. You can still make art. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is so amazing. I have a feeling that we, we had many conversations in this room about decolonizing architecture, and we're sta starting to grasp what what it implies and i think that there's something very unique of this conversation because and uh i mean there's no question why you're actually keeping it for years because i think there's something very complex of your positioning uh, on the one hand you're an international architect uh, and you have offices in new york in zurich in niger um, and on the other you're also very local and uh, and and there's something of the how uh, being a local architect uh, in uh, uh, operating in in a place like Niger, and also international architect jumping into a place like Niger to work that is incredibly conflicted and is packaging many of the conflicts of our times. Uh, often local architects work in 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 different parts of Africa, and Africa is often seen as a flat and uh, territory uh, that is equal, like no matter where you are, like Ethiopia being the same that that Nigeria or Senegal or or South Africa or or even you know, uh, but that that it's uh, there's an expectation that is going to behave like uh, what kind of Western people think a, a, a local architect in a place like Niger is. Your work is challenging that. When we look, for instance, of your the technology that you mobilize is a technology that is very hybrid, that of course have things that are more earthy, but also is combined with concrete, and it's like in many aspects is incredibly, uh, let's say, um, similar to what would be built in New York and in other aspects there. So it's sort of avoiding representing what others would impose someone to to do. The other thing is that your architecture is also very critical of these saviors that arrive into Africa to interpret it, to do a big book about, I don't know, what what happens here, what are the dynamics, uh, and also saving and teaching uh, people in Niger how to build with their own technologies or whatever. So it's 
I think this situation is incredibly relevant. And also it allows to explain what it means to decolonize architecture, what it takes, the difficulties, the conceptual difficulties, the personal difficulties, the, uh, let's say, discursive, but also material, uh, technological difficulties that, that it implies. Somehow it allows to get into the detail. And the detail, as Mario would say, is not the detail that simplifies things, but rather the one that allows to articulate complex realities. And I have the feeling that your practice, uh, you're, you're really very professional, I would say, very creative, very very rooted in the, in the craft of architecture. But somehow, by operating there and being very serious about it, you ended up being also an amazingly important critical voice uh, but it's coming from those, what, what it means to operate there. And for me, this means that this conversation is incredibly relevant for all of us. So going back to what you've been discussing, as a professional, what is the difficulty of being aware that, there's, that you're operating in a decolonizing paradigm? Uh, and especially a professional that is both, let's say, local and feeling the pressure of how external images of what the local architect in a place like Niger uh, should be doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also as an international player, also avoiding this, this kind of uh, heroic uh, vision of the saber of the international player that somehow comes to explain what happens there and sell it to the world. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's too big, man. It's a big question. Um, also, you're giving me way more credit, way more credit than I deserve. Um, I think maybe one of the problems when you're an architect is that by default, you like humility. So it's almost built into our field. It's almost built into the way that we view the world, where we buy into the notion that we're these ultimate experts, um, which then means that we don't learn much. We don't allow space for other possibilities. And I think for me, that's, the, that's what I mainly do, I have to say, is always sort of restraining myself as much as possible to to really just interrogate what's around me and absorb it. And that's what's been the most helpful. So I almost don't have sort of this um, overarching view of the practice um, in a much more theoretical manner. Um, I actually have a much more detailed, as you were saying, view, sort of zoomed in view from project to project. Um, and I, often also don't wonder um, when I go to another place, how am I going to sort of operate in this particular place? Because what I ended up realizing was that as long as you are more about asking questions, as long as you actually are operating from a place of curiosity and learning, then you are bound to integrate some of the correct things into your solution. I think the problem is that we come to it already as experts every time. And so, you know, there's just kind of no possibility there to not just superimpose. There's no possibility to not, you know, silence. Um, yeah, I, th I, don't, I, don't, I don't, I feel like I don't have anything more intelligent than that to say for the simple reason that I think sometimes we also overthink it. We overthink it because we, again, consider that things have to stay within this certain kind of dogma and defined and be just kind of so precisely understood. But really, um, in a way, I, I, I want to operate in the same way. And that's why I think I called my chair architecture, heritage and sustainability. The idea being that a lot of the answers, as much as we don't like to hear that in the 20th century and modernism, also are in the past but it does not preclude thinking about the future. It does not mean that we cannot be contemporary and modern and all of those things. But this idea of erasure of the past um, in order to always be in the quest of this newness, you know, this innovation, you know, um, relentlessly is the problem. 
is part of sort of this superimposition, you know, um, impulse that we have. And so once, once we have enough respect for the thousands of years of technology and wisdom, you know, um, that is part of the human experience and actually allow that to also be part of our practice, then I think it just becomes so much easier and we don't have to, we don't have to struggle so much because I feel like we struggle a lot. We struggle a lot for relevance. We struggle a lot, you know, because we just end up just talking to each other. <laughs> um, we struggle a lot for uh, authenticity, you know, a whole bunch of different things. But a lot of that struggle actually would go away if we would just allow, you know, um, allow ourselves to come out of the 20th century <laughs> in how we think about architecture in general and what makes sense to do and how, how we kind of move forward. I'd like to maybe follow up on that and then we'll take another question. Um, I mean, I, mean, I absolutely agree in it. And uh, I mean, I, you know, that you're operating from a position which is not of the kind of heroic, you know, sort of architect or heroine, if you will. Um, but at the same time, there is such a kind of assuredness, you know, even if it's a kind of, I don't want to say quiet, but there's just a kind of like, no, this is sharp. This is, you know, the, the details there, the precisions there of thinking, but also of making and 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 understanding the understanding the context. And it, and I, you know, uh, imagine that it's also a kind of fine line to, you know, to sort of maintain in terms of, you know, not being, uh, not coming into a situation thinking that we know everything, but also being assured about what it is that we do know or how it is that we do understand the place. But I think that's actually what is provided by that um, intense research at the beginning, mm -hmm. that sort of interrogation at the beginning. It allows you to be more sure of what you put out there because there's something in a way, it's almost like a, it's peer reviewed somehow, mm -hmm. you know, through, you know, um, everything that you've um, accumulated in terms of knowledge or that kind of you've teased out of the context in terms of um, understanding, like I said, you know, sort of um, construction, you know, of the place, some of um, the um, traditions um, that are there in terms of spatial um, composition or understanding culture, understanding spiritualities, understanding all of these different things. Once you do that work, it's much easier actually to, um, to move forward with confidence. And then you sort of get this, this feeling that you kind of landed on something correct. It doesn't mean that it's the only solution, obviously, but it feels correct. Yeah. And the only reason why it feels correct, it's because of all of that excavation work mm -hmm. at the beginning. And for me, I'm, I actually don't think I'm capable of designing without doing that excavation work. I don't, I've, I've never tried it and I probably never will. I, I'm not capable. This is the only way I know I can practice, honestly. Hey, how are you? Uh, first of all, thank you. Um, I'm really happy to see you here. Mm -hmm. I, I've been following your work for a while. Actually, one of my best friends interviewed you for the yearbook of the Netherlands in 2019. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And since then, actually, that interview caught my eyes a lot because she, we've been working a lot about friendship, and she actually asked you about friendship, and you instead were talking about uh, respect. And I, re I really love that part. And my question is actually very selfish because I'm doing a, a research. Um, in, I'm, I'm Colombian, and in Colombia, um, last year, a, a river... Um, was granted uh, with the with the status of victim, not rights, as in many countries uh, you have the land has rights. In this case, the river is a victim because the Supreme Court had to understand that the cosmology of the people there is not separate; like it, they can be separated. So, if they are victims, the river is a victim, and the and the river has been exploited for gold, terrible, right? But that grants a specific. Um, Task, which is also reparations. And uh, reparations can be in the terms of yes, science to re redo the building or something like that. But the one I'm working with is about the ancestral technologies that are kept in museums. 
So at the beginning, when I started doing the research, I was very angry. I was like, oh, those pieces need to come back. But when I started talking with local people, they started saying, well, actually, Mother Earth sent those pieces there. Maybe they have a mission there. But it's more about respect. So I wanted to know, how do you deal with the issue of respect when a museum, usually that typology was actually something colonial, to actually show in Europe what they, they took from the colonies, right? And that's something that when I start talking with museographers or architects, it's very complicated to understand. And it's also going into a spiritual level that I also am very interested in. So I wanted to ask you, how do you deal with that or if you have that struggle with the museum? It's an excellent question and really important question. And that's why I'm so conflicted about museums as a typology and I'm still conflicted. You know, um, we, we did this one museum um, because somehow we were able to kind of develop a certain language that made sense for that particular place. I'm not completely sure that I would have done the museum had it been from another place, right? Um, and also because of a lot of the discourse around museums right now and restitution and sort of need to decolonize the museum, um, we also get requests for thinking about how to decolonize a museum that is in the West, for example, which is something I don't do, um, because there is no such thing. To your point, the museum is a typology that is here because of that plunder. And so there is no such thing as a decolonial museum. There's no such possibility as decolonizing the museum. The only thing you can do is divest yourself from those um, objects. Where they go, almost doesn't matter. So if you're serious about actually saying that you respect or kind of regret <laughs> also um, this harm that was done, this is the only way. But then we get lost in these conversations about, oh, but you know, but they wouldn't be able to take care of them, you know, in that, that other part, or, you know, people don't want them back also, because sometimes some of these objects were very sacred and had sort of, um, are associated with very sort of mystical and sometimes even dangerous powers. And people are just thinking, well, I don't necessarily want them back, but that's not really the point, right? At the end of the day, the point is they don't belong here. They were stolen. They're not yours. It's the only form of respect possible. Everything else is kind of window dressing, you know, to some extent. It's just not possible, you know. So either we just accept that this harm has been done and it cannot be undone and we keep on going, <laughs> um, or we, we do the only possible thing, which maybe one day will happen. I'm not sure. But then to go back to the initial part of, of your question about the actual places and what happens you know to these places i think this is still a question for us to ponder and uncover because the situations are so different from you know you were talking about a river you know for example um there are other types of similar conditions you know in other parts of the world and the question of what do you do you know and because what happens with the museum and with the, with the plunder is that it disconnected people from practices and cultures by taking away some of these objects and the, what's important is not even the object itself coming back it's the fact for example that that object can no longer be duplicated because you don't have it so you can no longer continue whatever practice the object was used for for instance so there's just sort of so many layers you know in there but i actually don't think that we can talk about respect at all it's not possible because it's already insanely violent on the out outset. There is no repairing that. Sorry, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this amazing conversation. Uh, I, I was really uh, taken by your uh, uh, kind of um, appeal to the moment of unlearning after school uh, and like uh, your you've also referred to the suspension of kind of certain received knowledges uh, uh, i was thinking that uh, i mean you presented as easy but you, we know that uh, coloniality is so uh, stubborn and like uh, and 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 uh, how kind of modern ideologies are 
so resilient, right? The, so I, I wanted to know, like, uh, what have been the kind of uh, value systems or the principles that is taking more effort to kind of unlearn? Like, uh, what, what are the challenges of this kind of process of liberation from uh, coloniality and modernity as kind of intertwined uh, <clears throat> intertwined in uh, architecture or teaching, right? Uh, so, yeah, if you can share the struggles, the, 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 the more difficult things to get rid of. Definitely the question. <laughs> I mean, that's the struggle, right? You know, we have this conversation all day long with students, with other people. I mean, it's just, this is sort of, you know, for, for, for most of us, this is a kind of, it possesses you, you know, this question. And I think one of the reasons why it seems so daunting and difficult to solve is a problem of knowledge. So we were talking about the books, you know, earlier. But one of the things that happened through colonization is not just that our spaces and environments were colonized um, in terms of, if, if you go, for example, on the African continent, especially in West Africa, um, and in French West Africa specifically, um, the cities we have today were master planned by the French during colonization because it was a set settler, you know, they, they settled. Um, and, but then they settled, but they also made cities that were made for exploitation, for resource extraction, and for segregation. So there's sort of this legacy then that's there that you cannot really tear down these cities. What do you do with them? But to your point, we've all sort of observed this idea that the only way to make a city is a Western city. The only way to make, you know, anything is kind of the most house, you know, you name it. And one of the reasons why it's difficult for us to come out of that is that we don't even have access to the knowledge of where these places, what these spaces used to be before colonization. So the reason for that is that also the knowledge is also here, just like the objects from the museums. So a lot of um, the, the knowledge might be in some objects. It might be in documentation that was, you know, done during expeditions, you know, by by various um, agents um, throughout the world. It's photographs that have been taken before plunder or before um, entire cities were raised to the ground um, by colonizers, et cetera, et cetera. But all that knowledge is here. It's knowledge produced by academics who are from this part of the world, but that go elsewhere and make it sort of kind of a, the terrain of, of their um, investigations and of their career. But again, it's for a public that's here that uh, who doesn't care or ha doesn't have any need for any of that information. And then as a result, just like the way that um, this kind of dispossession from the objects in museums is also a knowledge dispossession, which then means that we do have to start talking about issues or kind of a, a concept of knowledge restitution in the same way that we're talking about object restitution. Because how else are we going to think through our own environment, think through, imagine futurities, you know, when you don't have anything to grab onto aside from what was left over from colonization or kind of the way in which um, environments have been sort of altered, altered through um, colonization. So I would say that that's one big project in my view, you know, that would take a long time, but that actually needs to happen. It's this kind of restitution of this um, knowledge, you know, body of knowledge back to where it's most needed so that in a way, um, new continuities can be produced. And there's also a, a question of systems of enclosures in terms of borders which were arbitrary mm -hmm. that were that were constructed. So, mm -hmm. which essentially then sort of, let's say formed fences mm -hmm. or boundaries to knowledge, sort of moving from one place to another. Right? Absolutely, you know, I mean, because so. You have the, the real fences, right? Again, in, in ex colonies, especially on the continent, it's kind of the, the most dramatic example is that almost all of our borders are artificial. Our countries make no sense logically. Most of us don't really belong in, within the same national borders, which creates, of course, incredible instability, difficulty, you know, kind of developing a national identity, but also kind of fragmented, you know, um, heritages and fragmented. Um, knowledges and, and sort of how do you build something together. But then you have, you know, all these additional borders, you know, unless you are 
European or American, if you're European or American, you can go anywhere in the world. It's for yours to to um to visit, to settle in, you know, to do whatever you want. Anybody else that is not from that part of the world needs visas that they will never get <laughs> half the time, depending on what part of the world you're from. So then that means, and again, usually those are the countries whose knowledge, whose objects, whose cultures, whose heritages have been stripped away. So then there's sort of this additional barrier. So not only is it outside of um, these um, new national borders, but you have no way of even encountering them. I have the microphone right now, but I'll sit after. Um, so here. Hi. Uh, so I have a question on the daily market project. And there's this like openness and fragmented nature about it. And recently, uh, in my current studio project, I've been thinking a lot about openness and privacy and how to negotiate between them. Like, does an open space necessarily mean a safe space? And in Core 3 Studio, we're currently working on housing, um, but my studio is particularly looking at it from the lens of children. And when I think about a market, uh, especially in West Africa, as someone who's experienced going to the market in West Africa, I think a lot about um, children coming home from school and coming to the markets and things of that sort. And one of the factors I'm really thinking about currently in studio, looking at it from the lens of children, is safety. Um, so I guess my question really is, what are some of the factors um, to consider when looking at a communal and social space? And um, how do I put this? Yeah, how, especially from the lens of children, and what what factors? Okay, how do I put this? Okay, so one of some of the things you considered <laughs> were um, sustainability, um, echoing um, some of the existing spatial qualities of the market, and that was successful. But what other things do you have to consider when you're looking at communal space where children um, often um, have, um, move around that space and create memories there. There's absolutely no universal answer to that. Just like for everything else, this is the point. This is actually the point of what I've been talking about. Is that I think um, in the way that we're educated, we're being taught um, rules that are supposed to be applicable everywhere. And there's something very problematic about that. So when you're thinking about the market situation, it depends. Where is this market? If the market is in Lagos or it's in Ibadan or it's in Abuja, it will be different what you need to do, right? So I think one of the one of the um, one of the aspects of the work is to actually resist simplifying the problem and to really engage with those specific conditions. There are things that can be generic, but when it comes to the issue of safety, clearly Lagos is a completely different you know, um, environment than Dandaji. So there is absolutely nothing that happened in that market in Dandaji that should be applicable for Lagos. It's just very difficult to make sort of the link between the two, This is despite the geographic, relative geographic proximity. It's just a completely different animal. But when it comes to safety, again, you know, it's at the end, issues of safety are, there's so much investigation that needs to be done, you know, when you're thinking about safety. What kind of communities are there? Are there a lot of women in the market? You know, are, are the children, the children of the women who come to the market? Are they children who are coming to the market, coming from school, going home, et cetera, et cetera. It gets extremely detailed so that you can then start seeing, you know, and the reason why I'm saying, you know, are there women in the market is because also there are certain markets that are very male dominated. And what, does, what that means in terms of the presence of children is completely different than a market where there's a strong presence of women. So... I would say that in these kinds of situations, you have to really get actually to the details in order to find the right solutions. Hi. Um, thank you for the conversation. It was 
think I find it quite generous and also quite patient. I do want to acknowledge that. I think, you know, this is more of, I'll just, a tiny comment before an actual question. Um, you know, it's, it's great to talk about decoloniality in sort of institutional spaces that we're all sort of sharing and having been a person working in really large institutions, including this one or, you know, museums, you know, I really sort of respect and admire your patience and often having to sort of share and do sort of a therapy for a structure, you know, that basically is begging for help to help themselves decolonize. I mean, in that way, it's it's not like a flippant comment, but it's sort of, you know, I find in your very stunning, beautiful work, there's so much calmness in this, and there's something also Mario have uh, commented on. You know, I wonder if there's this sort of, there's like an aesthetic translation or even a material translation to this calmness, which, you know, maybe circling back to this idea of decoloniality in which you know, we see all over the world, it's, you know, people are also begging violently for people to stop enacting violence on them. You know, where does that sort of express in architecture? And maybe segueing to like a little bit specific of almost like a technical question into this is I always wonder with people who build with earth, you know, it's so beautiful, it's so stunning. But there's also this sort of element which I find a little bit frightening sometimes in which earth and soil has to be almost purified in order for it to build with or to extract, let's say, a certain kind of value of productivity out of it in which, you know, as it inhabits the earth, as it inhabits all these different relations ecologically, it doesn't, you know, it's not a sort of single uniform thing. So I guess, I'm, you know, so I guess this sort of question, comment could be addressed in all sorts of ways, you know, materially or even, you know, contextually in the sort of space, you know, position, position as, you know, let's say, a racialized sort of identified identity sort of cast on the outside, you know, how does that translate into the way that one could design or think about architecture? Because I think you have many questions there. Um, when it comes to the material, I think, again, it's about actually knowing enough about the material to realize that sometimes some limitations we see are surmountable. So what you were describing about earth, for example, um, how sometimes it needs to be sort of purified, it depends, you know, depending on the kind of earthen technology or earthen sort of technique you're approaching. Some it's sometimes it's true and sometimes not, right? Depending on where you are, um, geographically, it would be also a completely different sort of set, set of um, considerations, you know, to have. I think at the end of the day, it's really about recognizing that architecture in general, up until you know before the the twentieth century, was really an emanation of a climate, but also of a geology, of a geography in, in inside of a geography, and that once you pull from that, then the kind of resulting architecture tends to be a lot more, of course, in symbiosis with the environment, obviously. Um, you talked about calmness. I feel like that's actually where that's also coming from. There's something about rootedness that actually has a very calming, in my view, sort of outcome. Um, and it's a lot of work only because um, we have spent a lot of effort running away from all of these different considerations um, in, in kind of um, to replace them with not only standardization, which is a good thing, um, but also mechanization, um, technology for technology's sake, et cetera, et cetera, which then makes everything we make seem just so daunting and complicated. I think sort of the kind of our, sort of rested and restful um, architecture tries to shed that or can try to shed that if that's what you're looking for. You know, um, it's really about that geology and it's about that, you know, the kind of that, it's almost kind of on a tactile level, right? So 
there's sort of certain things that come with cer using certain types of materials in certain settings with certain lights, environmentally speaking, that produce a certain effect. And usually when something is rooted, it always sort of gives that feeling. And also natural. Um, when these materials are natural, also they tend to do that. Um, so I wanted to... I wanted to ask about the first project you talked about, which was the mosque. Um, and what did you learn about and what was your role in linking or intersecting the developers from the capital to the local masons who were able to finally build build the Adobe domes? And what what skills does one not uh, does one need to operate in this intersectionality? And um, how do you instill or describe this idea of reclaiming the spirit to developers or people who have power or capital in the context? It's a million dollar question. <laughs> so the first part of your question. Um, one of the part of, one of the aspects of the story of this project um, was that there was kind of this existing mosque, right, that we rehabilitated. But then um, quickly discovered that that existing mosque, something that I've said many times before, was actually um, made by a master mason from a village um, nearby who, that won an Aga Khan um, in 1986 for almost the same mosque. And it turns out that it was a series of four mosques in that region that he made that all were kind of more or less the same. And so then the first thing we did was go to that village and trying to find those masons who built the mosque. So the master mason had passed away, but his second in command, who was actually, it turns out, the, the one who was in charge of the mosque that we rehabilitated was still alive. So one of the photos actually showed him um, in, in the slides. And again, it's sort of acknowledging that we don't have that know-how, right? I don't have that know-how. I was not trained you know, with these kinds of techniques. So I needed someone who's an expert, these are experts. These are experts just like any engineer, any, you know, they, they, they sort of, um, and that goes back to your question about precision. Mm -hmm. You know, these are skills that are transmitted in an extremely serious way. They are organized in guilds. It's very professional. And I think once we start understanding that, that just because you didn't sit in an amphitheater, <laughs> you know, um, in kind of a, another part of the world or kind of, you know, looking at architecture a certain way or seeing it a certain way, um, does it mean that that knowledge is not um, in, the, in its purest form actually within you in terms of your, um, your abilities and your skills? And so what we did was just kind of go and look for the experts. It was really that simple. So we looked for those experts. Then we found other experts through another project actually um, who uh, had worked with us on um, the housing project that we did prior to the mosque project. And they had helped us make the vaults um, inside of the homes. And they had these amazing um, suggestions for the traditional, traditional um, masons related to how to treat adobe and to make it easier to maintain for example so normally adobe has to be replastered every year which was a problem which was one of the reasons why um the um the village leaders wanted to basically destroy the mosque and they wanted to create a concrete version of it in its place so they appreciated the architecture expression they were just sort of fed up with the maintenance of the material and so these masons these kind of hybrid masons um, just just the very simple things. There were, you know, techniques they knew about where you mix the mud with shea butter, for example, um, to make it waterproof, to apply it outside, and it also hardens it, which then allows it to only need maintenance every eight to nine years instead of every year, for example. There were other techniques where um, for the mud inside, because there's, for example, a lot of problems with... Um, Mites, um in the wood because um, that traditional construction has wood actually inside. It's like reinforced mud. So instead of steel, you actually have wood inside. Gets eaten now and kind of er eroded out by termites. And so they have these um, approaches where they mixed in salt in the mud uh, with gum arabic to make it fluid and you apply it like paint, for example, but it's mud. 
So again, this is, didn't come from me. I did not learn this, you know, in a book. And there is no book actually that says this, right? So it's really about allowing um, these skills to express themselves and really providing the space for them to feel that their, their knowledge and their skill is respected equally. This is kind of a meeting of equals, not a meeting of someone who came and who's an architect and who sort of, you know, has sort of this knowledge and this, this um, expertise. But actually, if anything, they were the experts and I was completely ignorant. So that's really what, what that was. It was really about trying to find all the skills every time we recognize something that we did not understand or that we did not how to know how to reproduce in an authentic manner, trying to find the person who knew how. This has been a terrific conversation. Thank you for your generosity, as Dr. Thank said, you. and I look forward to the continuation of this Always. in another year or two. Exactly. <laughs> so, that would be amazing. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you so much.